the digital, how digital technology has changed our relationship with the arts. Something I know you've thought about. I'd like to hear all of you comment on the technology and the arts. Well, I'll simply say that uh, nobody would accuse me of being a, an apologist for the digital world. I'm much too old to be that. Um, but I do think for the arts, it's, it's overwhelmingly positive. We have the potential now to have access to all the works of art ever produced anywhere. And often, let's be frank, you can see it much more clearly and much more detail on your screen than if you're at the Louvre or the Metropolitan trying to elbow, the, elbow the in. Gallery of um, more and more of these things are productive and active. Um, the Museum of Modern Art has just produced Arts Lab, which is quite exciting. I mean, you can, uh, anybody of any age who can you know, you know, manip 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 manipulate a, a handheld or a pad um, can create all kinds of very interesting abstract things and uh, rearrange them. And uh, the, the, the Media Lab presentation, I think it was yesterday morning, um, was the most exciting multiple intelligence thing I've ever seen. This was the Makey Makey. Did you, some of you see that? Yeah. Where, where, you know, they, they, you had uh, students uh, creating a musical instrument uh, um, uh, alive in front of us, but they were, when, you, when you saw what had been done, there was graphic stuff, there was dance stuff, there was music stuff. So I think it's overwhelmingly positive. Full stop. I still want people to do things with their hands, with their bodies. With each other. With each other, other. Yes, I mean, absolutely. I think that's the, yeah. the, the isolating one of the experience. isolating experience of that yes. is palpable. And then there's a difference between learning about the arts as well and learning through the arts and learning with. And so I think both, again, legalistic approach, all of it. I mean, a huge number of things that can be shared via you know, the internet that are you never in history. It's unbelievable. I mean, you can just spend the rest of your life just starting now, and you will just keep going. You just keep going, and that's a beautiful thing. But in search of your you know, GHP, uh, <laughs> we, need to, well, we need to look yeah, at it. We don't want them to be obsessions. I mean, people spend way too much time, and we have, have data on this, either just on Facebook mm -hmm. or just in a multi-user game, and they resent it, but they're not, they, are, they can't break the habit. And I think that's where having some contact John, do you with other people. think there's going to be a backlash to that at some point? Because I, I think I mentioned yesterday, I just worked with the presidential scholars in the arts in, at a museum, and they said they don't want any more technology. They want to have their moment in the museum mm -hmm. because it differentiates so far from what they're normally doing. And because curating is a skill. There is a reason why paintings are hung in a particular way and why we appreciate sure. them in a certain sequence. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, it's essential to teach kids the importance of being disconnected. Um, you know, you look at the research on creativity, and uh, one of the first lessons we teach kids in second grade is, you know, to stop daydreaming, to focus on the blackboard. And of course, in the last decade, we've learned that daydreaming is an essential skill for creativity, right. that people who daydream more score much higher on tests of creativity. And it's because when you daydream, you're mashing up ideas in new ways and so forth. So are you telling them they shouldn't be listening? Is that <laughs> I won't be offended if they're not, um, as long as they come up with a new patent out of it. Um, <laughs> but I mean, just to get back to, I think, how technology is, is changing the nature of creativity, I mean, what, what excites me the most is the democratization of the tools. The fact that you can go back even five years ago and to make a movie on your own, you would have had to invest in some expensive hardware. Now you can make a movie with this computer in your pocket. Um, so the tools are getting much cheaper and more accessible. And this gets back to, I think, the connection between passion and doing and happiness. Because there are these wonderful surveys where you give people beepers and you beep them at random intervals during the day and you ask them on a scale of one to nine, how happy are you in this moment? And what you learn is that commuting is the worst. Sitting in traffic makes us miserable. House cleaning isn't fun either. Spending time with our kids is just above house cleaning. <laughs> TV, I think you'd get an argument on that. <laughs> TV's a bit better than kids. But, but at the top of the list are those people who can engage in what are called flow states. Those people, and just, you know, you know, as Howard mentioned, this doesn't apply to most people, but those people who can have moments where maybe it's knitting, maybe it's painting, maybe it's making a movie on your iPhone, who knows, but when they're fully immersed in a challenging activity, they lose track of self-awareness, they lose track of time, they are fully immersed in the moment, that is when we are happiest. And so I think to give kids the ability at a young age to experience those flow states, that, that's, that's an incredibly important gift we can give them.